How important is a professor in a student's life? How important is an advisor? How important are your peers, those you interact with in your college experience? Through the classroom and the transfer of knowledge, professors have the ability to enhance and transform the way we think. But beyond that knowledge transfer, we have the ability to connect and transform our entire lives. When I reflect back on my own collegiate journey at the University of Tennessee at Martin, I can't help but think of a few pivotal figures that transformed my life. Dr. Carol Eckert. Dr. Eckert brought me to the intersection of art history, civilization, and religion, and she formed the groundwork for my current spiritual path. Jason Stout. Jason Stout told me that there was more to music than listening to emo every morning at 8 a.m. Lane Last. Lane taught me that you should always be yourself if being yourself meant that you had crazy hair and wore a floral shirt and strapped sandals to class every day. And Dr. David Macbeth. David taught me that even a big, burly man can make the most delicate pottery. And there were others. Doug Cook, Diane Shaw, Melanie Hollis, Pamela Fiedler. The list goes on and on. And I didn't know it at the time, but these faculty members were also teaching me how to connect with people that were very different than me. People that had different interests and life experiences and people that looked at the world very differently than me. They were helping me to challenge my biases and they were showing me how to connect with those around me. They were teaching me how to build and utilize social capital. You can imagine that when I became an adjunct professor at Southern New Hampshire University's Salem Center that I carried this with me. I knew that I had more to contribute to this world than just that knowledge transfer. I had an even greater responsibility to the students around me. I had to take the time to understand their story, their interests, what they needed from me, who they were. And to take it a step further, I had to ensure that I encouraged them to do the same with me and their peers around them. I had learned that true transformation comes through exploration and cultivation of human relationships. These relationships help us to expand our reach and our social capital. I've mentioned social capital a couple of times now, and you may not be familiar with what that is, but essentially, social capital is the value derived from positive connections between people. Social capital is built from relationships, your relational capital. What you have to share with the world, your cognitive capital. And your brand, or how the world sees you, your structural capital. And although technology, social media, and the pandemic have had extreme impacts on the way we connect, the importance of human connection has not changed. We all need each other. As with most things in our society that are meant to help people progress in a positive manner, social capital too has been targeted and limited in support of antiquated hierarchy based around race, sex, and class. Through these archaic systems of racism, classism, sexism, and every manner of segregation in our society, we've created an in-group and we've created an out-group. The deliberate othering has created deep-seated biases within us and ushered in the creation of stereotypes for any and everyone that does not fit the mold of what our society considers a cultural norm. The exploration of this and many other topics has led to the creation of the Cognitive Bias Codex, which currently lists 188 known biases. If allowed to, these biases will manifest within us and when we leave them unchecked, hinder our ability to create meaningful, diverse relationships. Relationships that are mutually beneficial. Relationships 
that help us to connect with those that are different from us, whether by race, sex, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic class. Unfortunately, I myself experienced some of these biases while I was in my undergrad. My college journey actually started out as a miracle. In fact, when I mentioned it to my grandmother, she laughed in my face. There was a time whenever I was going through uh, my elementary school experience, very poor, where I was bullied in the fifth and sixth grade for the clothes that I wore. My mother, I was a a single mother, and my, my father had passed away in an altercation with the police whenever I was three. So it was very difficult for me to envision going to college. By the time I reached my junior year of high school, I found out I was going to be a dad. My guidance counselor advised me. She thought I had the ability that I might actually be able to go if I would focus myself, but it's kind of hard to focus when you're dealing with all those things. Having already became a statistic, it just it wasn't looking good for me. But then a miracle happened. I went ahead and I applied, and by the time... It was time for me to graduate and go. Uh, The state of Tennessee actually introduced the state lottery. And as part of that, they had to allocate some of that funding um, to lottery scholarships for students that needed them. And somehow I met the criteria and I got one of those scholarships. I knew that with the scholarship and working my overnight job at Walmart, that I would be able to make this work. And and I did for a while. Um, Things were going pretty well, but eventually the exhaustion of of school and work, it it got the best of me. One night after an all-night shift, I apologize, one morning after an all-night shift, I was was in class and my my music professor seen me dozing off. So he came over and he slammed his book down on my desk and woke me up and then berated me in front of all my classmates. Another reminder that I was poor um, and couldn't just come to his class with a full stomach and a good night's sleep. And whenever I tried to connect with my professor about this issue, he let me know that it was my problem. It wasn't his issue that I didn't fit the mold of a traditional college student. It wasn't his issue that I had to work overnights or that I had a son. His bias was keeping him from being helpful to me and and honestly making him a barrier to me. Luckily for me, there were a lot more Jason Stouts than there were professors like him. So what do we do? How do we ensure that we are interacting with each other in a way where we're beneficial to those that we come in contact with and not a barrier? First, we have to take responsibility for our impact. We all have to understand that our actions, our empathy or lack thereof, and our biases addressed and unaddressed impact the world around us, and that we are either helping to retain an archaic system of separation or we're actively helping to dismantle it through understanding empathy and diversity within our social capital networks. Second, we have to take responsibility for our own journey. It's not someone else's responsibility to educate you on the importance of human relationships and human connection. It's not someone else's responsibility to recognize and address your biases. It's not someone else's responsibility to help you make the most of the relationships around you. You have to commit to a journey of growth, development, and connection with those around you. A commitment to be open in your journey and connect with the amazing diversity that exists within our world. Finally, we must remember to hold the door for others. To quote Paula Blank, president of Southern New Hampshire University, we must all remember that talent is universally distributed, but opportunity is most emphatically not We have a responsibility to help others along the way, be a positive influence in their journey, and most importantly, being open to how all those amazing, diverse, wonderful people around us can be a positive influence to us. Thank you.